Hey there. So each time I come get set up to work on the van, I usually set up an extension cord that I just run out the door. I need this for powering lights, fans, tools, and whatever else I need while working in here. I thought, why don't I go ahead and just add the shore power inlet now, earlier on in the build, rather than later when I'm working on the electrical system. And not just add the shore power inlet, but turn it into a functional, useful power strip on its own. And then I can get rid of the other one. And I left the cable long on it so I can move it around anywhere I need in the van. Then, when the time comes to build the actual electrical system for this van, I'll disconnect this box, save it for the next project, and tie my shore power inlet into the system's inverter charger. But for now, I can just have the van plugged in from the outside and power what I need to inside. So in this video, I'm gonna go over how to install the shore power inlet port and how to set up this outlet box, which has GFCI protection and four receptacles. The first step to installing the shore power inlet is to drill a hole for it. Pick your location carefully and be sure the other side is easy to access inside the van. I drilled the pilot hole for my hole saw first and then added the actual hole saw onto the arbor in order to keep things more controlled as I started drilling. The shore power inlet I'm using requires a 2 and 7 8 inch hole, but I used a 3 inch hole saw as that's what I had and it wasn't too big. Double check what size hole your shore power port needs before drilling. Once the hole was cut, I test fit the power inlet and marked the screw hole locations with a long pencil. I then used a spring-loaded center punch to make a divot so the drill bit won't slide as it gets started, and then I drilled out pilot holes for the screws. Make sure you use a drill bit smaller than the threads of the screws you mount it with. After this, I used a metal deburring tool followed by some sandpaper to smooth out the edges of the hole. We are almost ready to paint, but first I used a vacuum to clean up any metal shavings from the surrounding area. Then I primed the freshly exposed metal edges with some Rust-Oleum Clean Metal Primer. While that paint dries, we can assemble the outlet box. Here are all the different parts needed to piece this together. A two-gang metal outlet box. I'd recommend the type with rounded edges rather than square. A cable entry gland. 10 AWG Marine Triplex wiring. A cover plate for the metal outlet box. A GFCI outlet. And finally, a normal outlet. I'll link to all the parts in the description below. With this type of outlet box, the receptacles attach to the cover plate with a small nut and bolt rather than attaching to the box itself. In order for them to fit into the back of the cover plate, you have to break off the ears or mounting tabs at the top of the receptacle. You can do this by bending them back and forth with a small pair of pliers. But make sure you buy outlets where these tabs are already punched out to break off easily. Once they are off, the receptacle can fit into the cover plate like this. We don't need to bolt it on yet, just make sure it fits. Repeat this for the second outlet. Now I'll take my cable entry gland and install it through a knockout in the top of the box. This secures in place with a nut, which I'll tighten with some pliers. I skipped the rubber washer that came with the entry gland since this won't be a waterproof setup. Next, I prepared the wire to go into the box by marking how much of the sheathing to strip and then stripping it off with wire strippers. The outer nut for the entry gland needs to get placed over the cable before running the end of the wire into the box. I then tighten down the outer nut of the entry gland, which locks the cable in place and provides strain relief if the wire gets tugged. Next, I'll prepare the green ground wire for connecting to the ground stud in the box. I needed to cut the wire a little shorter, and then I crimped on a ring terminal. I'm using a ring terminal because looping stranded wire around a screw never feels as secure to me, especially with wire like this where the inner strands are pretty fine. I actually first had tried doing this by just stripping a section of the ground wire and looping it around the screw, and while it probably would have worked, it just didn't seem as solid or secure to me, so I redid it with the ring terminal instead, and that's what I'd recommend. Next, I need to prepare a ground pigtail that will also connect to this stud, and then connect to each of the outlets. To do this, I cut three lengths of wire and stripped the ends and crimped on a ring terminal on the end of one wire and a spade terminal on the end of the other. I'll explain why the different types of connectors in a second. All three wires will be tied together using a Wago lever nut. A twist on wire nut could be used as well, but especially for stranded wire, I prefer the Wago lever nuts. 
Next, I took the end with a ring terminal and connected it to the stud in the box along with the ground wire from the main cable that enters the box. Here is a wiring diagram to better illustrate each connection. Each of the other ground wires connects to the ground screw on each of the outlets. One has a ring terminal and the other doesn't because the connections on my two outlets were different. The GFCI outlet had a back wire clamp so the stripped end of the wire could slide under the clamp plate and be screwed down. This type of terminal works great even with stranded wire. The second receptacle I was using had a more basic screw terminal for the ground connection, one that's meant for a wire to wrap around the screw. So for this one, I connected the wire via a crimped on spade connector for a more solid connection with the stranded wire. Next up, I'll connect the hot and neutral wire from the main cable coming into the box to the line side inputs of the GFCI outlet. The GFCI outlet has one set of connections labeled as line and a second set labeled as load. In order for the GFCI protection to work properly and protect the second outlet, you must connect the line versus load correctly. The line side connects to the power source or the power coming into the box and the load side connects to the second outlet. The black wire, which is the hot wire, connects to the brass colored screw and the white neutral wire connects to the silver screw. To connect to the second outlet, I cut a small black wire and a small white wire and used it to connect from the load or output terminals of the GFCI outlet to the terminals on the regular outlet. Here's that diagram again showing the proper connections. For the regular outlet, it doesn't matter whether you connect to the top or bottom terminals as long as you connect the hot or black wire to the side with the brass colored screw and the neutral or white wire to the side with the silver colored screw. This outlet I was using also had a back wire clamp plate for the hot and neutral terminals just like on the GFCI outlet, so the stranded wire could slide under and then be screwed down and the plate keeps all the wires together without the need for a spade terminal or other special connector. At this point, double check that everything is wired into the correct terminals. Now each outlet can be bolted onto the cover plate. The nuts and bolts for this should come with the cover itself. The small machine screw drops in from the front and is secured with a nut on the back. Next, all the wires can be tucked into place inside the box. With stranded flexible wire, it's much easier to get everything folded back inside than with less flexible solid core wire. Finally, the cover plate screws on with two screws on the front corners. We can now prep the other side of the cable that will connect to the shore power inlet on the outside of the van. The final connection for this will need to be done passing the wire through the hole in the van, but I'll go ahead and get the wires prepped now. The back housing of the shore power inlet has a screwed on cable clamp that the wire needs to pass under. I fed the wire through this to determine how much of the sheathing to strip off. You want the sheath to be under the wires where the cable clamp secures over them to keep them protected. I strip the cable sheath back and then I strip the end of each of the individual wires. For these, I removed just a little over a half inch of insulation. Next, I'll crimp on ferrules to the end of each wire. The purpose of the ferrule is to keep the ends of the stranded wire together as they feed into the terminals on the shore power inlet. The ferrules are easy to crimp on, but you do need the right size ferrule and the right tool. I'll link to those and other tools I've used during this video in the description below. After putting the ferrules on, I test fit them in the terminals on the shore power inlet. It seemed like the plastic collar of the ferrule was preventing the wire from seating all the way into the terminal, so I pried slash wiggled off the plastic collar. I was able to do this mostly with just my fingers by twisting and wiggling it forward, but the last one gave me trouble so I used some pliers to help tug on it. Here's what the ends of these wires look like now. I fit the ends of the wires into the terminals on the shore power inlet, and now the wires seated all the way into the terminals. We don't need to tighten these down yet and can actually pull the wires out and head back into the van. Now we can take the end of the wire that we just prepped and stick it through the hole in the van. Then feed the rear of the shore power inlet housing over the wires. Next, I'll put each wire into its corresponding terminal on the shore power inlet. The terminals have a colored ring to denote which wire goes where. Green is ground, black is hot, and white is the neutral wire. After each is in and screwed down, I'll go through with a torque screwdriver and make sure that each screw is tightened to the torque rating specified in the instructions that came with the shore power inlet. Now we can put the rear housing onto the back of the shore power inlet and put the wire strain relief clamp back in place and screw it down. 
Then you can place the whole assembly into the hole in the van and screw it into place. I'm using a stainless steel screw that's about an inch long for this. In order to prevent stripping the screws in the metal, I only use the driver to set them lightly, and then I finish tightening them by hand. And that's it for the port. Let's test things out. I don't have a 30 amp supply, so I'll connect a 15 amp adapter so I can hook it up with a normal extension cord. With the setup I've shown in this video, I only plan to use this with the 15 amp adapter on the power inlet. But I set this up using a 30 amp shore power inlet and corresponding 10 AWG wire because when I build the electrical system for this van and convert this inlet so that it's connected to the inverter charger, I want to have the ability to connect to 30 amp sources at campgrounds. The first time it's powered on, you'll most likely need to reset the GFCI on the outlet. I grabbed a fan to test that the outlets were all working and everything's good to go. That's it for this one. I hope this video has been helpful and good luck on your camper projects. See you on the next one.